I want to greet you all in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. So glad to be here with you today. And uh, boy, just to sit here and to really think about what this group represents. I mean, you guys are the testimony of Jesus Christ. You have Jesus and the Holy Spirit in this place today. All of you have amazing stories and accounts of Christ working on this planet through you. And to come here together and to lift up our name, the name of God together, wow. It's really quite uh, breathtaking, so it's really awesome. Just amazing who you meet. You know, every one of you have a story. Met a, a lady named Nancy in the back here who is the sibling of 17 uh, siblings. Her father was a minister. And uh, she uh, said she had lung cancer back in 2009. And as she was sitting on the MRI table, she said she saw this light come off top of her, went away. They did the MRI. Doctor came back and said, I don't know where that cancer went. It's gone. And it's just amazing how the Lord heals, the Lord works. But, you know, I just walk by her and say, hi, Nancy. And she says, let me tell you a story about God. And that's everybody here. Everybody has these neat accounts. I mean, and all of you together represent the powerful name of Jesus Christ. So, so grateful to be here with y'all today. So why don't we get at it? We're going to be back in the book of Genesis. That's right. And uh, I have some good news and I have some bad news for you today. What do you want first? The bad news. Okay, first off, the bad news is this is our last sermon in the book of Genesis for 2019. Yeah. No, that is the bad news. So who said that's the good news? Well, no, just kidding. I know, I know I wrote, I just said that. No, yeah, we have had just a blast going through the book of Genesis, but we are going to hang that up for a little bit. And this brings me to the good news, is we're going to spend some time in the fall looking at um, this one word that shows up time and time again in Scripture. And uh, this is part of a process that Andy and I have had the last few months in just asking the question, what does a healthy church look like? And then even more important, what does God expect of a church? Um, what are the expectations of God? And as we've been studying that, this word in the New Testament pops up time and time and time again, directed right at the people of God. The word in Greek is alelon, and when you translate it from the Greek, it means one another. And you'll see this over and over and over in Scripture, right to the church saying, this is the expectation that God has for us as to what a healthy church looks like. And so, so uh, the Bible makes it really clear, Paul makes it clear that a really healthy church is a church that's like a body, and the body where Christ is the head of the church, but then that all of the body has parts that work together that build each other up. And so this is that one another thought. And as we get into the fall, one of the challenges that I gave Pastor Andy was to create some connection groups or some small groups um, where we continue to gather outside of Sunday morning uh, as a church body to do life together. And so along with that challenge, along with this sermon series, um, we have come together. Andy has done an incredible job, spent about three or four months and wrote a devotional for you. And this is something something new for Trinity. We want to do more of this, and we're excited to have a writer on staff who likes to write. He says, I really like to write. And I'm like, oh, boy, geez, what's, why would you do that? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, loves to write. Um, he loves to, and he's, he's very, very intelligent, um, and he wrote a wonderful 10-week devotional series for our church to do together that coincide with the sermons that I'm writing, okay, that I reluctantly have to write because I don't like writing as much. Much, but it's, it's still, we do it. And so we're working together on this. Um, I really recommend you pick up one of these books. They're $5, and that covers the printing. That's, that's why we have to do that. It actually doesn't quite cover the printing. And they're right over in the snack room now, as we'll call that from here on out. Okay, that being said, we're excited about the next 10 weeks, um, but we are going to be focusing on chapter 41 today in the book of Genesis. Um, we're going to continue on with this encounter that we started last week between Joseph and the Pharaoh. Um, this is a great uh, book, great chapter. I want to thank you for letting me take time to read the whole chapter last week, all 57 verses, so that we can see the full context of this. It's important that you do that. Um, now we see Joseph. 
Joseph is before one of the most powerful men on the planet, okay? And he's it's very, very important, and they're having this conversation. Now, 13 years prior, as we've been studying, Joseph was given a dream that he would be a very, very important person, so much so that his own family would bow down to him. But for the last 13 years, what we have seen is that his life has been anything but that. So far, Joseph was a nobody, and he had nobody. He had no friends. He had no family. He had no country to call of his own. He was nothing, and he had nothing. It's like that old joke that Pat always tells me. She says, when I was born, I was born with nothing, and I still have most of it. This is how he was. He didn't own one thing, not even the shirt on his back. The shirt on his back was taken from him twice in his life. He was a low life in the world standards. His rap sheet would have said slave and prisoner. Joseph was nobody to everybody except one person or buddy. Who is that? God. And because he was somebody to God, wherever he was, he prospered. Joseph had absolutely nothing on this earth except for one thing. He had God. And because he had God, he had everything. You know, if all you had on this earth was God, would it be enough? You know, sometimes I think it takes losing it all to come to grips with that. Sometimes it takes going through trials and testings that take us to a place where we can stand before the world and say, you know what, it's not me. It's about God. I think that's what's happened to Joseph the last 13 years. See, God had this huge dream for Joseph, a dream that was so much bigger than Joseph or how, what Joseph could see. I mean, he was going to be used to preserve the Middle Eastern world from an extreme drought. He was going to save his own family in the process, preserving the Hebrew nation. He was also going to preserve the covenant of God, which would eventually, through this covenant and through this nation, would bring a savior, the Messiah. Messiah, who has saved the whole entire world. I mean, this is a big dream that God has for Joseph. And to fulfill that dream, God had to make sure that Joseph was, uh, that God was the center of Joseph's life, okay? And this is what we're seeing in chapter 41. He's now 30 years old. He still has nothing. The only thing he has is this God-given ability to interpret dreams. That's it. And so here we see in 41 that Pharaoh has these dreams that no one can understand. The butler, it was reminded that during uh, the crisis, how Joseph interpreted a dream for him while he was in prison, the butler told the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh summoned Joseph. Joseph went before the greatest power man can obtain and, and, and was asked for, and if they could help. And Joseph said, not me, God, not me, God. And this is where God needed Joseph to be, to be at a place where he says, it's not about me, it's all about God. This statement, I believe, is only developed out of a life that is exercising faith and endurance. That's what James 1 tells us. It says, listen, count it all joy when you face trials of many kinds, because the trying of your faith produces endurance, so that you may become perfect and complete. Now listen, the essence of spirituality is our faith. The preservation of our spirituality is endurance in the midst of that faith, okay? It's all summed up in that statement that Joseph said that we saw last week, not me, God. Joseph went through all of those trials and all of those testings so that he could live by faith in God alone. You know, that process is the same for us today. Okay, and this is what I want to focus on today as we look at chapter 41. What is striking to me throughout Joseph's story is how he maintained faith in God in a secular environment. I mean, did you notice that? Okay, he was in this secular environment for the last 13 years. Egypt is going to represent the secular world for us, and Joseph is going to represent the spiritual mind within this story, okay? When Joseph was 17, he was sold into this environment against his will. Not once do we see him waver from his faith in God, and it's pretty interesting to me. Egypt was considered a polytheistic culture, which just as a $5 word that means they served many gods, okay? Now, it's not not much different from today's culture, okay? Because today's culture, there are many gods that people worship. You see, we're designed 
by God to worship. We are designed to want to serve a higher being. And so anywhere around the world, you're going to find worship. It's what they worship. And here in our culture, there are many gods that people lift up and worship, okay, much like the Egyptian culture. In this culture, the Pharaoh himself was divine. They had many different views of the afterlife. They had uh, the practice of embalming. Just about everything was different than uh, what Joseph believed. And yet, here he is right in the middle of it all serving God. In fact, as we have seen the sovereignty of God play out in Joseph's life, we see that God actually placed Joseph there, didn't he? That's interesting to me, okay? God was going to use this secular world to bring about his purpose. And while Joseph was there, do you think that he learned a little bit about the Egyptian culture? I mean, absolutely, right? He was inundated by it for 13 years. Do you think he was ever pressured or tempted to live the way that the culture lived at that time? I mean, absolutely. Let's look at Potiphar's wife as an example of that. A tremendous pressure to live a way different than God. How about this? Do you think he was ever mocked for looking different than the culture around him? I would think so. In fact, when you ever you see an Egyptian person like Potiphar or the jailer or the butler speak of Joseph, they use the term that Hebrew guy. Okay, this is kind of a racial slur. It was kind of like, yeah, here's one of those Hebrews that are out there. He's, he's different than everyone else. And I think that as we look at this chapter, we can learn about how to maintain a spiritual mindset within a secular culture. Okay. Now, when I talk about the secular Secular world, I want to be clear that I am talking about a world system and a philosophy that are not of God. Okay, and this whole process is called worldview. And we'll just do a little quick 101 on worldview. I'm sure you're all familiar with that, but worldview is your conception of how life is supposed to operate. Within these, there are two main categories of worldview there is the secular worldview, and there is a spiritual worldview. And within those categories, there's all kinds of subcategories of different people and their beliefs, okay? The secular worldview, in that view, man is the center, okay? Man is the center. The world is the only reality, and man's experience is the sole measure of value. Does that make sense? That's what drives that worldview. The spiritual worldview has God as the center, and there is another life beyond this world. Eternity is a governing reality, and a life devoted to God is the measure of value. So do you see the difference in those two worldviews? Okay, so listen, the word secular has many meanings, most of them which are not good, we, but in the midst of that, I have to be careful to note that the secular world is the world in which even the most spiritual person is called to live. All right, does that make sense? All of you are called to live on this planet, okay? If you're not, please leave the planet. Every spiritual person that has had any impact, including Joseph, did so in the midst of a secular culture. Jesus told his church to do what? To go to go into the world, okay, make disciples. This was the Great Commission. This is where Jesus did his ministry. This is the example. Many of the secular world's concerns are common ground concerns for spiritual people. Things like government, things like farming, things like education, public health, law enforcement, toilets not working, got to call a plumber. All of those things are common ground things that we have to look out for. And so, the critical component for understanding worldview is this one easy statement. Where you start is where you end up. Okay, does that make any sense, people? Some people are going, eh, not really. Okay, so let's look at this for a second. All right? This is where the difference really happens. I want you to think of any particular issue that you want to think of right now. Think of government, think of politics, think of family, education, social norms, Republican, Democrat. Think about it for a second, okay? Now, take any, risk, any issue. If the man is the center, then that will direct how those issues will come about. Does that make sense? If God is the center, it'll direct those issues and how you think of it. All right? So you look at those things. Let's, think, let's look at science for a second. Bo there are both secular scientists and there are 
Christian or spiritual scientist. Both have the same observable dot data. Okay, where they take that data depends on their worldview. Does that make sense? Especially when it goes beyond observable data and we have to go into hypothesis. We have to look at creation. We have to look at the universe. We have to look at those things. The worldview will drive that. For example, we have these bones that have been labeled Lucy. All right, they're an incomplete skeleton of an, an extinct creature. Beyond observable data, we have certain data that we could use, but beyond that, the worldview philosophy will drive a hypothesis that this is a missing link, okay? Artists will create human features that aren't there with the bones. They will stretch the bones. They have the bones where there's missing big chunks, so they say there's a foot difference there, so they stretch the bones to make it look like they have long legs. They shorten up the legs, arms, to make them look like they have human arms, whatever it is. But their hypothesis drives the unobservable data. They place the bones together. They use uh, human skin. They create a storyline, a diet, everything to present a theory as truth, but it's just theory. Now, Christian scientists can take the same observable data. They can take the same bones, and they place a hypothesis based on their belief that God is the center, and they'll use monkey skin, and they'll look at those gaps and say, there's not big gaps there. Those are just regular monkey legs, and their arms are longer, and so they conclude that this is just an extinct type of primate. So this is where I say, where you start is where you finish, all right? And do you start on the word of God or do you start with man as the center? It's either Father God or it's Mother Nature. Everyone with me? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, moving on then. Now, this is where we get into Joseph. The secular worldview has several issues that I believe God has brought people like you and I to help solve, okay? The secular worldview has trouble understanding the spiritual aspect of life. If you remember when Del Tackett came here, he had this little box as an analogy, and he talked about this box being the secular worldview, and everything that they believed has to fit in the box. And the problem is, is that there's so many other other things to life beyond the five senses and the observable data that we have that go unexplained. And so they have these real big issues. They're limited. And there's the spiritual nature of God is in everything. The attributes of God are clearly seen, but they don't fit in the secular worldview. And so they often go... Um, confused by it. They often don't understand it. They pass it off. Some will even say this is evil, this is wrong, those kinds of things. Now, this is evident in Pharaoh's dream. God presents two dreams that no one in Egypt could understand. Did you notice that? I mean, they assembled a committee. They got the brightest people involved, but not one person out of all of the staff of the Pharaoh could figure out these dreams. And so what I see in this is that a spiritually minded person when we look at being spiritually minded, we are called into a secular world to communicate God's word, to be able to decipher God's word. And that's what Joseph did. When Joseph came before Pharaoh, he had no problem understanding the dreams because he was in tune with God's will. He could see it. And that's why we're called into the world. Do you remember when Philip met this guy on the side of the road? I think it was an Ethiopian official or something like that. And the Ethiopian was reading the book of Isaiah and couldn't understand a word of it. And, and uh, Philip comes up and goes, let me explain what this is about to you. Let me explain this is. How many people do you know that have tried to read the Bible without that spiritual mindset? They've just looked at it and said, this is just nuts. You know, it just it makes no sense. This is where you and I are called to come beside these people and say, let me explain what God's word is about to you. It means you have to know the word of God. Romans chapter 10 says this, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in the one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without somebody preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. See, one of the problems that spiritual-minded Christians have is explaining spiritual life to a secular mind. It's hard, isn't it? It's hard. They can look at you funny. And sometimes we don't do a good job at it. Sometimes we don't decipher, we just confuse it a little bit more. Here's a, little, here's a little project for you, okay? Go out today and go up to somebody 
that doesn't go to church and just say, hey, are you washed in the blood? <laughs> and see what they say, okay? They may try to mace you or something because that is just weird to say that kind of thing. Now, we get it because of what the Bible says. But it reminds me that we can chase people away with spiritual language. We have to remember that they don't know what we know. That we have to meet people where they're at without compromising or watering down the truth. That's what Jesus did throughout ministry, did he not? That's what Paul did on his missions trips. One time I was working at a propane station, and there was these two boys that were helping, 15 and 16-year-old boys, and, and I wanted to talk to them about Jesus, and so I tried to find a common ground with them, and they loved country music, country music every time, blaring country music, okay? And so country music has a lot of references to God in it, and so I would use the opportunity for these songs to say, what do you mean by God there in these, in these, these things? And they really didn't really know other than it's just a nice song, and they ended up wanting to go to a Garth Brooks concert, so I went and bought Wrangler jeans and a big belt buckle, and we went to this Garth Brooks concert together, and it rained, and the jeans got wet, and I physically could not get them off my body <laughs> until they dried. I was with a hair dryer because they were so tight. And anyway, after they had found out that I cared for them, they said, what are you into? And I said, man, I'm, I'm into Jesus, and this is what I'm about. And these two guys accepted Christ, and they ended up getting baptized. And it was an amazing thing, because I met them where they were at and explained the truth that they hear all the time, that God's word is everywhere. It's evident, okay? The, another immense problem the secular world has is understanding right from wrong. You see, in a worldview that is secular, there's no objective foundation. You know what I mean by that? There's no objective God that makes rules of right or wrong. So right or wrong become subjective. They become subjective to society. They become subjective to personal preference. Another word for this is called relativism. And so different groups will try to come together and come up with rules for society. The government tries to play a role in this. But again, that government is subjective to whoever is in the office at that time or uh, whatever part of the world you live in. And so there comes a point where the spiritual mind, when we are called to a secular world, we have to be here to convey right and wrong, good and bad. We have to talk about this universal right and wrong that people don't understand. You see, I see this aspect in Joseph talking to the Pharaoh. Remember, who gave Pharaoh the dreams? Okay, and who put Joseph where he's at? So this is all about God. Joseph had good news and bad news to deliver. He had to tell Pharaoh about them both. Without both, the message is incomplete. What would have happened if Joseph went to the Pharaoh and said, oh man, I know your dream. In seven years, you're going to have seven years of great harvest. Isn't that good? God is good. Let's go eat cake. And he stopped there. Okay? It would have been incomplete. They wouldn't have saved. They would have all perished in the famine. When the famine came, they would have cried out and said, boy, I thought God was good. What is happening here? You know that God has placed you where you are at with a message that belongs to him. We cannot speak of a savior without telling people why they need a savior. Okay? The good news without the bad news is an incomplete message. Does that make sense? We have to learn how to tell the subjective culture that there is an objective good and evil, that there is a heaven and there is a hell, that there is holiness and there is sinfulness. Now, some people are really good at talking about the good, and they avoid all the bad. You know, God is so good, and he's loving, and he's fluffy, and he's, boy, he's soft, and you just cuddle him, and, you know, and he'll never hurt you. You know, and you know what? God never says that kind of aspect about himself. He said he's loving, but he's also just. And we set people up for a failure when we present a God with no justice. Some people are really good at talking about the bad and not mentioning anything about the good of God. And they use the Bible as a weapon to beat people over the head with it instead of love them towards God. Remember that little skit we did here where the kid was stuck in sin and, and the preacher came up and the preacher hit the kid with the Bible and said, man, you are evil. You're evil. Take away the E and you're vile. You're vile. Take away the V and you're ill. Take away the I, you're going to L. You know, that's the kind of stuff. We don't want to do that, okay? That's a misrepresentation. Completely misrepresents God. And said, you know what? God calls us to speak the truth in love, okay? We have to convey good and evil. We have to call sin a sin. 
no matter how unpopular that may be. You know, it probably wasn't the best news for Pharaoh to hear that there was a famine coming, but it had to be told. It might not be the best news to tell somebody, hey, you know what? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us, no one is righteous, no, not one. In fact, the wages of sin or the results of sin is death. That's why we have this corruption and this hardship and these hurts. But not beyond that, there's a second death, a death where we are disconnected from God for eternity because of sin, because God is so holy. But this is what's so amazing about grace is that God pursued us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He paid the penalty for that sin on the cross. His blood was shed for us. And so are you covered in the blood? That's what that's about. And then when you accept him into your life and you live for him, not only do you have him today, but you have him for eternity. That is what makes grace so amazing. That's what makes salvation so sweet is the good and the bad bad, that God is the remedy for the spiritual famine in our life. And listen, I would rather offend those that I love to heaven than compliment them to hell. Number three, one of the biggest issues that I see in the secular world view is just the way that they wrestle with the meaning of life in general. Boy, you see that a lot on, on social media. You see a lot of people saying, what's the point? You see people ending their lives early because of the desperation that's out there. Listen, they don't have a view that goes beyond the life that they have right now, and some of their lives are really just trash. Some of it's really hard. You know, they see or they experience the corruption of sin in this world, and they don't have a reasonable answer for it. And then you couple that with being taught that they exist because of random chance, out of natural selection, That life has no cosmic meaning. It's just do the best you can, get the most you can, and then cease to exist. Do you see how that brings such a shallow meaning to life? So many are taught that life is void of spiritual meaning. This leads to just depression and hatred, desperation to get moments of happiness, a mindset that says, why even try? There's a verse that sums it up. It says, let's eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. I believe that Christians are called into the secular world to be a champion for God's will. Look at verses 33. The dream is deciphered. Pharaoh gets an explanation, and then Joseph goes one step further. Beyond telling Pharaoh the dream, he volunteers as an agent of God's will. He says, put somebody in the land that will oversee what God says will happen. And I want you to think about how bold this is. Joseph says, listen, God has told you what's gonna happen. I know it's still just a dream right now, but you, have to, but, but you need to put people in place that will champion God's dream and prepare people for what's going to happen. Then in front of the wisest people in Egypt, all the magicians, really the apex of the secular culture, this nobody, presents a plan to Pharaoh that is practical and precise and completely driven by God's dream. Isn't that incredible? We are called to do the same thing in our culture. We need to stand before the apex of this, of humanity and champion God's will. The Bible says, listen, you're to be doers of the word, not hearers only. We enter into the secular world to communicate God's word, to convey right and wrong, and to champion God as an agent of his will. Amen? This is a quote by Stuart. It says this, When those who profess to belong to the Lord begin to demonstrate that faith without compromise and with a mission to serve the secular world, even the most secular people will note the uniqueness of their lives. And given the right circumstances, they may seek their help and advice in time of stress or strain. Now, let's look at this in light of chapter 41. Verse 37. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this, in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all of this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards to the throne will I be greater than you. Listen, there are three possible responses that I want to end with today that a spiritual person can have living in a secular world, okay? This will ruffle some of your feathers, but you know what? I need to do that from time to time, okay? 
three different responses. The first response is isolation. There are some in here today that have taken a stand that says, listen, I'm just not called to share the gospel. I'm not called to live in this world. I'm going to get out of this world. I'm going to cocoon myself and not live in it. You isolate yourself from the world. You become so heavenly minded that you're useless on earth. You know, there are whole churches that decide to do that. They don't open their doors to anyone that doesn't look like them, that doesn't know the gospel. So no one preaches the gospel. They sit and they have really nice, great time together and they sing great songs and it ends there. No one champions God's will in the culture. Those are the churches that are dying off because the spirit's off of them. They're not doing what they're asked to do. You are called to be spiritually minded in a secular culture. That's how every saint before you has ever lived, and that's how Jesus lives. And if you challenge me on that, I'd like for you to read Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Okay? It says, let your light so shine before men. Do you know why? That they may see your good works and will glorify God in heaven. Okay? You are that person that stands in the gap. Or the second response from isolation is imitation. And I think this is probably the biggest problem in Christianity today. Some spiritually minded people go into the secular world only to become Christian chameleons. All right, do you know what I mean? Go in and just blend in. Don't look any different from the rest of the world. I think there are people that fall into this trap all the time. I mean, I think churches fall into this trap. I think really, especially about 15 years ago, there was this, I think, genuine effort to reach out to the world and the church world. So, and to do this, they said, you know what, why don't we start to conform to this world? And church services started turning into rock concerts. And sermons went from conviction into spiritual inspiration. And they sprinkled it with a verse or two along the way. It started to become more about being liked and accepted versus understanding the power of God. And churches grew exponentially, but with no roots, little conviction. And today there's a little statement that says the church can be a mile wide and an inch deep because we just want to be like the world. We are called to be different. We are not uh, uh, residents of this world, the Bible says. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. And the Bible says it very clear in Romans, do not be conformed to this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The third response is secular world. This, this is the response that I see in Joseph. And to keep the I theme, I used infiltration, all right? See, Joseph's sense of calling was coupled with a consuming desire to serve God in this culture. He understood that God placed him there with a mission. If he was to be a slave, he would obey and work as under the Lord. If he was imprisoned, he knew that God was with him, and so he served. If he was standing before the Pharaoh of Egypt, he would boldly communicate God's word. He would convey even the unpalatable truth of pending doom, and then he would champion God's will as an agent of preservation. Listen, we need Joseph's in our culture today. We need those who stand unashamed, who infiltrate the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need Christians in our entertainment today on TV that represent Christ. We need that American Idol winner who after wins the whole thing, boldly gives praise to Jesus. We need that athlete who gives God the glory in the interviews as he, in, as, he, uh, as he plays. We need that teacher to convey right and wrong in the school. We need that lawyer and that judge who believes in law and order, that musician who declares the glory of God, that artist who declares the beauty of God. We need the good neighbor who loves those who are sitting right next to him. We need that coach and that an employee and that governor and that senator and that president to be agents of God's will as they lead the country who will say, it's not about me, it's about God. Guess who that person is? It is you. It is you. All of you represent this community. All of you represent some different aspect of employment or, or whatever. All of you, though, represent the power of the name of Jesus. It's amazing. Go into the world with a mission. Communicate God's word and love to those who don't understand it. 
convey right and wrong, heaven and hell, sin and forgiveness, champion God's will wherever God has, has you. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. You are the light of the world. And no matter how dense and dark the shadows become on this planet, they cannot stand before the light. Okay? Understand that. I want to leave you with two questions that I, I see here, okay? I want you to hear two questions. One is secular and one is spiritual. Okay, the first one is from Pharaoh. Pharaoh asked, said to his servants, can we find someone like this in whom is the spirit of God? Listen, the world needs that person to, be, uh, to answer the questions that the world is asking. The second one is from God himself. He says, I heard a voice from the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Whom will go for us? The answer is send me, I'll go. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time in your word. And uh, Lord, um, most people here, you know, they know and understand worldview. Some people here may have never really thought about that. Thought about how... Um, where they come from is, is, is where they go and how th this has shaped their thoughts and their beliefs. And some people might have, are new at Christianity and they're learning about God's truth and they're trying to make God the center. Some um, may be going the opposite way. Some believers here might be thinking, you know what, I didn't realize how much of the secular world is driving my beliefs and the way that I live today. But God, I would pray that we would understand that as a believer with the Holy Spirit living in us, we need to put you in the center of our life. That like Joseph, we have to declare, it is not about me, it's about God. And may that be the ethos that drives everything that we do. And then as we go into this world, I pray that first of all, we would infiltrate this world with a mission to serve you. But as we do that, God, we would understand that we're dealing with people that just don't know you. They don't understand the spiritual concepts. They, 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 it's scary and foreign. They've been told other things that it doesn't exist. And as we go out, we need to trust you and your Holy Spirit to guide every step of the way. And Lord, I pray that you would give this congregation the mission and anointing to go out and represent you as agents of your will and wherever, they ha wherever you have them. May they com convey right and wrong by living their life out. By being honest, I pray that they would uh, uh, communicate God's word and be able to explain it in such a way that someone that doesn't understand it will be able to understand it. And may God, would you please guide us as we strive to be like you. Help us not to be ingrown. Help us not to isolate. Help us not to look like the world, God, to be relevant to the world, but not to imitate the world. And may we just go out and serve you by being your hands and feet. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for your word. And Lord, as I always ask, if there's people here that don't know you as Lord and Savior, oh God, would today be the day that your Holy Spirit speaks to their heart. And may they decide to make you real in their life. Where they say, I'm gonna take this chance and I'm gonna go by faith and I'm going to receive Jesus Christ to my life. I pray, Lord, this, this would be a beginning point for them to learn how to serve this amazing God. We love you, God, and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.